Okay, so I made a video about fake lost media in the past. Or rather, we looked at pieces of lost media that some people thought were real, but later turned out to be hoaxes or simply misremembered. And I think that topic is pretty interesting. And thanks to Semi-Deuce on Reddit, we now have a fake lost media iceberg that goes into a lot more of the interesting, obscure, and downright crazy pieces of fake lost media. And I thought we would go ahead and take a look and descend to the bottom of this iceberg. So sit back and relax as we dive into the fake lost media iceberg. A day with SpongeBob SquarePants. So to start off, we have an absolute classic. One of the most iconic pieces of lost media, a day with SpongeBob SquarePants. Now, if you're familiar with lost media at all, you've probably heard about this. Jorge, as well as many other YouTubers like LSSQ and Rebel Taxi have made countless videos on the subject, and it's been covered possibly more than any other piece of lost media to date. But to give a quick rundown in case you haven't heard of this before, it's basically a mockumentary that was supposedly produced that would be a parody of SpongeBob SquarePants, which was to be distributed by Regal Films, who had a synopsis of the film on their website saying, quote, in this mockumentary, Spongebob lives above ground, like all Hollywood superstars. Afraid that Spongebob is becoming old news, his boss runs a contest called Spend a Day with Spongebob. The contest makes Spongebob the talk of the town, as thousands of kids enter to win. The lucky winner is Seth, and he is ecstatic about his day with Spongebob. However, the day becomes a roller coaster ride as things do not go quite the way they planned. Now, there is an incredible amount of lore associated with this film, but to kind of break it down to its basics, the film was never actually made, but there was a mysterious figure called Mr. Orange, who was revealed to be the movie's alleged director, who wrote the script for the film and attempted to have it produced by many different studios, pitching the idea for the film. And for this pitch, Mr. Orange and some others created a fake movie cover, which had a pineapple house drawn similar to Spongebob's. And Regal Films did make the effort to put the film on Amazon for pre-order, even though production had not even yet begun. And of course, it was never actually made due to many reasons, one of which being that they were risking being sued by Nickelodeon, so the film was never made. However, it was announced in 2016 that there would be a crowdfunding effort to produce the film. However, that campaign never launched, and the only thing we have from this film's production materials is a sample of the script written by Mr. Orange, which contains only five pages. Saki Sanobashi. Ah yes, good old Saki Sanobashi, otherwise known as go for a punch. I talked about this before in my pieces of lost media that don't actually exist video, and what I find most interesting about this specific entry is that some people actually do still believe it exists. Now sure, it is possible that Saki Sanobashi does exist, Although it is very, very unlikely, and we will get into why. But if you don't know what Saki Sanobashi is, it's an alleged piece of lost media that was first discussed on 4chan, when a user described a strange and disturbing obscure anime series he had seen, which was about a group of young girls trapped inside a bathroom with no doors or windows. And as the anime would go on, it would get more and more disturbing with the characters all starting to lose hope and eventually commit to ass it was in gruesome and violent ways. Naturally, this piqued a lot of interest, and many people began searching for this lost anime. However, back then it wasn't known as Saki Sanobashi. Actually, the user said they remembered it as something like, go for a punch. And the story was just vague enough with a hint of realism, such as the strange broken English title, where people, while skeptical, believed or wanted to believe that this strange anime really existed, and many spent hours searching for it. But of course it was never found. And in fact, someone claiming to be the original poster of the 4chan story claimed in a Reddit post that Go For A Punch, or what would be called Saki Sanobashi by some, was indeed a hoax that he had perpetrated. Still though, some doubt the claim that this person on Reddit was the same one that posted on 4chan. Even so, there is no evidence to support that Saki Sanobashi ever existed. The Legend of Dratini Dub So Pokemon hasn't been without its fair share of controversies over the years. And one of those was with the 35th episode of the original anime series, titled The Legend of Dratini, which contained a scene in which Ash was held at gunpoint. And this did not go over well with the American dubbing studio 4Kids, and so an English dub was never produced, although some believed that it was simply never aired. 
This was proven false though when the English voice director for the series, as well as the voices of Brock and James, done by Eric Stewart, stated that the dub was not produced for this episode. Spongebob, I was a teenage Gary, deleted scenes. Okay, this is a pretty classic one and it's really fascinating to me. So if you grew up watching Spongebob, you might remember the episode, I was a teenage Gary, in which Squidward starts turning into a snail after accidentally injecting himself with snail plasma. Well, during the episode when Squidward turns into a snail, there is a kind of strange and sudden wipe transition that cuts away from Squidward being injected by the needle, and then to him being fully transformed into a snail. Now it is theorized by many people that there was actually a deleted scene of Squidward transforming into the snail that was either cut or removed from further airings of the show. And this was supported by many people, saying that they actually remember the transformation scene when they watched the episode for the first time, and remember it being very disturbing. However, it was eventually debunked, as there was no proof of its existence, and a Reddit user actually managed to find a VHS recording of the original premiere of the episode, and there was no Squidward transformation, of course. There are also many other reasons why it can't exist, like how it would not fit their usual time slot, and how they already showed the transformation of Spongebob, which may be what people were actually remembering, but even so, it's still a fun one to think about. Deno Senshi Porygon Dub This one is pretty well known, even if you've never seen the Pokemon anime series before. So, the episode Deno Senshi Porygon, which is known in English as either Computer Warrior Porygon or Electric Soldier Porygon, which was the 38th episode of the Pokemon anime. But like The Legend of Dratini, it only aired in Japan for a very tragic reason. When the episode first aired in Japan on December 16th, 1997, one scene in particular would cause a lot of undue harm. During a confrontation with Team Rocket, Pikachu used his Thunderbolt attack and created a huge explosion on screen, which created a bunch of flashing blue and red lights, which in turn caused over 10,000 people in Japan to experience symptoms of epilepsy, which were for some mild, such as blurred vision and headaches, but for others, sudden blindness and seizures in severe cases, with at least 685 children having to be sent to hospitals due to epilepsy-induced seizures. Obviously, this sparked a massive controversy, and Pokemon was pulled from air for four months, and the episode was banned, never to be re-aired again. The existence of an English dub of the episode, while unlikely, was still thought to exist by some, and was simply just never aired. Although the actress of Ash, Veronica Taylor, revealed in a 2004 interview that no dub was ever made for the episode. However, the voice actress of Mouth, Maddie Blaustein, and the voice of Brock and James, Eric Stewart, both claimed that an English dub was actually made. Although it is unlikely that they would have had the footage from the Japanese broadcast. So it's really up in the air if this really exists or not. We may never really know. Polybius. Honestly, I'm surprised that Polybius didn't make it into level 1. I mean, this is such an iconic video game urban legend. But to give a quick summary, Polybius is a supposed arcade cabinet from the 1980s that was available in arcades somewhere in Portland, Oregon. The game was said to cause strange health problems if played, and was reported to cause headaches, amnesia, seizures, and even alleged suicides. It was also said that men in black suits would come by arcades and take data from the machines. However, only a month after being available, the cabinets vanished according to the legend at least. But yeah, I think it's pretty safe to say that Polybius never existed at all. Although it is a very fun urban legend and one of the first video game related ones out there, it's even featured on The Simpsons and in a Batman comic. But yeah, it was probably either started as a simple hoax, a fun rumor, or it was mistaken for the game Tempest, which caused very similar, although more minor health complications that derived from epilepsy. And maybe this was just over time exaggerated to the point where it became a completely different game entirely. Whatever you want to believe, Polybius is fake, but the legend still lives on today. Croc 3, Stone of the Gobos. Okay, so I talked about this game also in my Lost Media That Don't Exist video. And yeah, this one has a complicated mess of lore regarding its developers, alleged rights holders, engines, and a bunch more, so I'll try to just keep it a lot more simple. Basically, this game would have been a sequel to Croc 2 and was said to be in development from 2001 to 2005 which was stated by an employee of the company Argonaut Software, who was supposedly developing the game. 
However, that was a lie. And in a strangely overcomplicated tale, the employee describes how the game was in development. But then the voice actors needed to be recast, and then they were working on unstable game engines, and then they had to cut down the consoles they were released for, then they had an older version of the game engine that they had to use, and then the Croc IP was sold, and then the development was continued by another company. I mean, this storyline is so in-depth. I'm not surprised that people thought this was real. But of course, it was later revealed that all of this weird lore about the IP being sold and the game being in development for multiple years, yeah, all of that was false. As a co-producer of the original game stated that they actually still owned the Croc IP. So yeah, there was no Croc 3. But this was definitely an elaborate hoax, so I'll give it that. Keck Croc. LSSQ has covered this before, but this is an alleged Sega Genesis game from 1993 that gives me, uh packy art cover vibes. Don't worry, we'll get to that game later down in this iceberg. This game though, Keck Rock, was supposedly an unlicensed Genesis game that was remembered for having terrible controls, bad animations, and a notably bad password system. It also apparently featured the character Keck Rock, who the game is named after. This guy right here on the cover, who you would play as uh, and use a... <laughs> who you would play as and use a toilet plunger as a weapon. Now there is no gameplay of this game, and other than people saying that they remember it from their childhoods, there's not much else, except for this alleged soundbite, and this cover art. That's it. Yeah, I'm pretty sure this game doesn't exist. I mean, really, listen to this. Now there is no definitive proof that it is fake, I guess, but there's no proof that it exists either, so I guess it's up to you what you think about this. The Berenstein Bears. Oh boy, this is a doozy. So this isn't necessarily lost media in the typical sense. Really, the Berenstein Bears just represent the idea of the Mandela Effect, which is that there are alternate universes where things are slightly changed or different from our reality. And without noticing it, we can be transported to another universe where things are changed slightly, with some people remembering that they were different years ago or even in their childhoods. With Berenstein versus Berenstain Bears being a great example of that. People claimed that they remembered the Berenstein Bears, but now they're called Berenstain, which they don't remember. And it is believed that they have gone to a separate reality where one letter has changed in the name. And even going back to their old books they had as kids, it still says Berenstain. But I think there's a better explanation than alternate universes. And there have been many studies and doctors that know more than me that have talked about this phenomenon, but I'll just give a quick rundown as to why this may happen. Basically, people just misremember things, which may seem like a cop-out answer, but it's true, it happens all the time. And if people believe something that is even slightly off, it can still become a normal thing. For example, the iconic quote from Apollo 13, Houston, we have a problem, which is an erroneous quotation. It's actually, we've had a problem but it just makes more sense in context to say Houston we have a problem, right? Just like the Star Wars quote, No, Luke, I am your father. Well, would you be surprised to hear that Darth Vader never actually said that at all? He actually just said, No, I am your father. But people may have added context to the quote over time so that other people could understand what they were saying, and then that became the norm, so yeah. To end this long-winded monologue about the Mandela Effect, I think it can be more rationally explained. But hey, maybe there are many universes out there branching with every minor different change out there. Who knows? But to get back to the lost media aspect of it, no, Berenstain Bears never existed. No books, no merchandise. It was always Berenstain Bears. Or was it? COD Black Ops 4 for Nintendo Switch. Okay, I did not even know this was a thing, but yeah. I guess there was a rumor that Black Ops 4 was coming to Switch. Yeah, there's not much to talk about here. Other than I guess somehow the rumor started online and then ballooned as a bunch of YouTubers made videos about it. And so that led to a question during an interview with Treyarch design director David Vondahar, where he was asked if BO4 was coming to the Switch, which he apparently laughed off. And as we now know, yeah, BO4 never came to the Switch. And I don't know how this even really got started. Literally the only thing that can possibly possibly be maybe construed as a hint to this was that there was an emote in Black Ops 4 in which your player would play a Switch-like console, but that's about it. Packy. So I referenced this a little earlier, and uh, Packy, wow, what an interesting game. 
First of all, the name I guess is like a racial slur used in British slang, so uh, whoops. The game is known for having a terrible cover art, which is a staple of the company Phoenix, who have a lot of other great looking box arts. But yeah, this game was never actually real. The only piece of it that circulated online was this box art, which may have been used by Phoenix as a placeholder for the game, which they might have been working on, although it probably didn't make it past any initial concepts. But also, strangely enough, this art was used and actually stolen from a ray tracing competition. So yeah, pretty weird stuff. Stone Temple Pilots, Only Dying, 1993 version. So the Stone Temple Pilots are a pretty famous rock band. They started out just doing shows around California during the mid-1980s, before being able to create their first demo album in 1990. This demo apparently had some tracks that would eventually be re-recorded and used for their first studio album, Core. One of these songs was called Only Dying, and was said to be one of the band's best songs. But it was said to be much darker, and the band would choose not to re-record it for their debut album. However, in 1993, they did decide to re-record the song for the film The Crow. However, tragically, Brandon Lee was killed on the set of The Crow while filming. And due to the dark nature of the song, the Stone Temple Pilots decided to submit a different song titled Big Empty. And since then, the 1993 version of Only Dying has never been released or leaked, and it's unknown if they ever actually even recorded it in the first place, as it was only planned to be included in the soundtrack for the film. The first Five Nights at Freddy's trailer. Another piece of lost media I've talked about in the past, but a pretty interesting one, I'll say. So this whole mystery stems from one comment on the original trailer for the game on YouTube from a user called Wallmeat who asked about another trailer, which years later he would be contacted about on Twitter by another user asking about this trailer, and he claimed that it wasn't on Scott's YouTube channel anymore, but that it featured a different endoskeleton from the one in the original trailer. And people began searching for this alleged lost Five Nights at Freddy's trailer, and eventually through the Wayback Machine, a Reddit user called The Freddy Channel was able to get a link to Scott Cawthon's old Google Plus account, which had three deleted videos two of which were uploaded to Scott's YouTube channel. However, the last video, titled Five Nights, was lost, and it could only be speculated on as to what was in this lost file, but many believed that this was the lost trailer that Walmeet had talked about. However, on Twitter in 2020, Walmeet would debunk the existence of this lost trailer, saying that he was actually just referring to the current trailer, and while it's thought today that there really was no lost trailer, we may never know until we see what's hidden in the Five Nights video file. Animaniacs, Minerva Mink. This refers to a number of shorts that were allegedly produced in the early 1990s for the animated series Animaniacs. The show featured a number of comedy skits with different animal characters. One of these characters was Minerva Mink, who only had two shorts that were released for her character throughout the series. And due to her controversial character design, it's thought that some of the planned or even already created shorts featuring Minerva Mink were not aired. The evidence to support this being that in the two shorts that she did appear in, they were edited in post-production to make the character's cleavage less pronounced. However, on April 18th, 2016, Tom Ruger, the original creator of the series, participated in a Reddit AMA where he was asked about the existence of the lost Minerva Mink shorts, and he responded saying that there were no unreleased Minerva shorts, putting those claims to rest. Where in the world is Carmen San Diego? All the Lang gone. For the game show Where in the World is Carmen San Diego, there was an alleged lost episode from season 2 titled All the Lang Gone, which was going to air in 1992 but was said to be pulled due to a contestant on the show injuring themselves in a bonus round. There's said to be a bunch of other strange things that happened while filming too, like the actor Gene Wilder, who is known for his performance in Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, appearing in the episode, as well as stuff breaking and there having been a different host from another show, and some other convoluted stuff, but the point is, the episode was just so chaotic that after it was recorded, it was never edited or even aired. However, in an extensive investigation done by a blog called Buzzer Blog, it was found out that the episode indeed never existed, with the show's creators even going as far as to say the episode never happened at all. Kablam! Episode 29 This whole hoax started back in the early 2000s, when an anonymous user added an episode 29 to the TV.com and Wikipedia articles for the show. 
even though there was no evidence of them existing at all. Even so, many people began to believe that there was a lost episode of the series, and some even began to think that they had seen the episode. And so the story goes that the episode was planned to be the finale of the series and was to be about the main characters of the show, Henry and June, finishing their comic book and confessing their love for each other, before finally saying their goodbyes to the audience. However, it was theorized that this episode was cancelled because the show was getting some pretty high ratings, and they wanted to continue making episodes. This episode, though, has been debunked on numerous occasions by the creator of the segments, Mark Merrick. Like on one occasion, as a joke, he even posted on his website in 2015 an episode titled Episode 29, which was the actual Episode 29, not the alleged Episode 29 finale episode that people had speculated about. And even in 2011, it's said that he stated on a fan site that the episode is fake. However, there is no proof of this post existing, as the website no longer exists. So take from that what you will. Evil farming game. Oh boy, what a saga this story is. And let me say right now, if what you hear in this brief summary interests you, I highly recommend watching Wang's series looking into this game. It's very interesting, but if you just want to know the basic rundown about this game, it started off simple enough, as most lost media searches do, with a post from someone claiming on Reddit to remember a strange game that was similar to Harvest Moon, in which you have to not only run your farm like you would in any other standard farming game, but then also hide the body of your murdered wife and avoids suspicion from the police and the rest of the town. The user known as Spartan213 also noted that he knew almost nothing else about the game, except that it came out in the 2000s and was 100% not a browser game. Now it's a very interesting premise, right? Well, a lot of people definitely thought so. Videos were made, subreddits, discords. I mean, people began scouring the internet for this game in a five year long crusade for what was known as the evil farming game. And a lot happened during this time, but to make a long story short, it was found out that in 2015, a streamer named Joel from Vinesauce joked about a very similar game idea after hearing the name of a completely different game called Body Harvest. He joked that it sounded like Harvest Moon but with corpses, and that it's like Harvest Moon but you have to hide a corpse. A very similar description to the one given by Sparta213. And indeed, after seeing the clip again, he confirmed that this was indeed what he was actually remembering, saying he used to watch Vinesauce Joel's streams to fall asleep, which maybe is where the memory of the game came from. And Joel himself even talked about the game on stream, and apologized for creating one of the most sought after gaming urban legends ever. Really, it's a fascinating story. But on top of all of that, there actually is an evil farming game in the works right now, coming to Steam hopefully soon, titled Evil Farming Game Replanted. So we can all look forward to that at least. Ed Ed and Eddie, Special Ed. Another alleged lost episode. Not to be confused with the creepypasta Ed Ed and Eddie lost episode. Special Ed is said to have been the original 34th episode for the series. Not much at all was known about the episode and it was simply just a rumor. And as to its contents, well, that can only be speculated on. However, it is interesting to note that the episode was real, at least in terms of its concept, which might be where the idea that this episode exists comes from. Because in an interview with the series creator, Danny Antonucci, he talked about this alleged episode, and said that the episode didn't go through because it was quote, too real. Rumors about the episode though were put to rest when Bedhead Bernie made a video about the episode in 2016, in which he claims that no one working at AKA Cartoon, nor the storyboard artist for the series had ever worked on this episode, meaning it most likely never got past a conceptual phase. However, it is interesting to think about what Antonucci really had in mind with this episode, and what the original pitch may have really been about. And that can only be speculated on unless Antonucci ever reveals what was actually proposed for the episode. The Cheetah Girls Pilot In the early 2000s, there were a series of films, a trilogy that aired on the Disney Channel called The Cheetah Girls, which was very popular, and so after the first film was produced, a TV series was planned which would air on ABC. However, it would never air, and the plot behind the planned TV show is unknown. But according to MTV News, the series was in production in early 2004. However, the show ran into filming difficulties as one of the main stars of The Cheetah Girls, Raven Simone, was starring in her own Disney Channel show called That's So Raven during this time. 
which created scheduling problems, and eventually the show was cancelled altogether. However, it's been long rumored ever since it was cancelled that there was actually a pilot episode that was filmed for the series. However, this was finally disproven in 2019 by cast members Kelly Williams and Sabrina Bryan, who stated that, quote, Doing a Cheetah Girls TV show was always talked about, but there was never anything real happening with it, and they never even had a script or anything. Ed and Nettie, Junkyard Scramble Another piece of Ed and Nettie Lost Media. This was an alleged Game Boy Color game created for the series in 2001. It was said to be developed by Crawfish Interactive and published by BAM Entertainment. The game was believed to have existed thanks to a listing on JJ Games, a copy that was briefly on eBay, and even a listing from IGN. So yeah, many people thought that this game was made. It was thought to have been some sort of basic puzzle game, and was apparently priced at $29.99 on JJ Games. It's thought though that this game was cancelled in favor of the Ed and Nettie game Jawbreakers, which was eventually released for the Game Boy Advance. However, some still thought that this lost Ed and Nettie game was still out there. But on October 7th, 2017, YouTube user ComiKid uploaded a video where he explained that in conversations with one of the developers at Crawfish Interactive, he discovered that there were no files or anything related to Junkyard Scramble at Crawfish Interactive and the employee believed that people were confusing the game for the Game Boy Advance game Jawbreakers, meaning that Junkyard Scramble was never put into any stage of development, at least not farther than the concept stage. GTA San Andreas Golf Patch This one is kind of obscure but definitely interesting, and not something that I heard about until finding this iceberg. So apparently it was first mentioned by a Spanish Lost Media Wiki user named Shiki, who you may know from Blame It On George, or Blame It On Jorge's, Lost Media Iceberg. In fact, he was the one who made that iceberg. And in a strange but interesting turn of events, this entry about a San Andreas golf patch was completely made up by Shiki and his friends, in order to fool the Spanish-speaking GTA San Andreas community. Which actually worked and spawned some sort of Spanish San Andreas drama. I don't know man, you can't make this shit up. Apparently Shiki had some sort of grudge against these YouTubers for their clickbaity videos, and so tricked them into making videos about this fake golf patch by including it in the iceberg, and it actually worked. It's kind of funny, and it's a pretty interesting way of going about trolling, I guess. Super Mario 64, July 29th, 1995 build. Now there is a lot of deep lore regarding this entry, and I'll try my best to cover the most interesting parts, but it's a pretty long saga. So maybe in a future video I'll cover this topic fully. But basically this is a supposed build of Super Mario 64 that's dated July 29th, 1995. Mostly everything regarding this lost version of Super Mario 64 came from anecdotes told by people who were either able to play a copy of the game, or knew someone who had a copy of the game. This build in particular though was very interesting as being dated July 29th, 1995 would mean that the game predated the Nintendo 64, or Ultra 64, as it was first known in Japan on the patents. There are a lot of speculations and associations related to this build, and it's thought that it wasn't even produced by Nintendo at all, and was not actually a Mario game initially, and that it was also closely related to the personalized Super Mario 64 cartridge conspiracies, but that's a story for another day. So to make a very long story short, essentially this game was not a Mario game, but another game that was sold to Nintendo and reworked into what is now called Super Mario 64. And even though all of this reads like a creepypasta, which, I mean, it is, some thought that the game could be real, given all the anecdotes by alleged developers and interns, as well as screenshots and gameplay footage from the build that was given, similar to something like Ben Drowned. But yeah, it's not real, unfortunately. Every copy of Super Mario 64 is not personalized by some sinister and evil AI made by a shady Japanese corporation, I'm sorry to say. Doraemon, Adventures in Candyland Dub In 2005, there was an episode of the Doraemon anime series that aired called The Mystery of Goodyland, which was about the main cast of characters trying to catch a floating cake, before discovering that the world that they were in was entirely made of candy, and was in fact a candy-based theme park. For the US English adaptation, the episode was titled Adventures in Candyland, and was promoted to be a 30 minute special episode, as most of the episodes that aired in the US were cut down to be about 15 minutes. 
and it was to air on August 28th, 2015. However, it never did air, and although it was shown in various TV guides, the episode was lost, and it was believed that it never aired due to legal concerns over the name Candyland, which was owned by Hasbro. And instead, another episode, Nobi Nobi, Here's Our Man, aired instead, and so the lost episode, Adventures in Candyland, was never aired. However, in September of 2017, in a YouTube livestream, it was revealed that no one in the cast actually recorded voice lines for the episode, as it had not been approved by Disney. As to why that is, well, we can only speculate. When the going gets goth. Now we're getting into the more obscure ones. This animated series titled When the Going Gets Goth was an alleged Canadian show that aired in the 2000s that was thought to be made in Flash based on the design of the main character who was believed to have been named Veronica Von Goth. It was thought to have only ran for one season with 13 episodes, and the only proof of its existence, however, was this image of the protagonist, along with the title of the series, which was found on Twitter by an artist called Coolio David. He later claimed in a tweet that he didn't know where it came from, and so with no other evidence being found as to its existence, it's thought that the series is most likely fake. The Rhapsody Kids in a Bunny's Tail. This film was a proposed sequel to the 2002 Christmas film Rhapsody Kids Believe in Santa, which would have featured the cast from that film returning and would be released on Easter of 2003. The movie was first announced in the prequel special, which showed this image in the ending of that film. Now it's thought that because of this, that maybe the film was worked on and that there might be a rough cut of it out there somewhere, or at least some scenes that were animated. But as far as we know, that is not true, and the film was cancelled swiftly after the release of the first one, most likely due to the negative reception of it. I've never seen it myself, but wow, people really hated this movie. It got a 1.3 out of 10 on IMDb, which should be like a new record. So yeah, there was no sequel, thankfully. Cyber 6, Yashimoto, Private Eye. So it was kind of hard to find information about this one. But what I think this refers to is the lost, or allegedly lost, Fox Kids version of the fourth episode of the Cyber 6 animated series titled Yashimoto Private Eye. The series was adapted from a comic book series of the same name, and was created into this anime adaptation in 1998, although it wouldn't be released in the US until 2000. And the series was generally well received, however the US version done by Fox Kids was heavily censored due to the series being seen as too mature for young audiences. The censorship was heavy, and parts that were even mildly suggestive, violent, or just what the studio deemed as slow, were cut, and the series was later cancelled after only three months of airing. However, there was one episode that wasn't aired, besides the last two that were cancelled, and that was episode 4, which is thought to have just went unaired due to the episode centering around a kidnapping. However, the episode was more likely cut by Fox Kids entirely, in favor of having to heavily censor it. And so the episode most likely was not even dubbed at all. Satan's Sphinx. Here's a little bit of a spookier one. You might have heard of this one before. Scare Theater talked about it on his channel years ago. But basically the premise behind it is that there exists a video called Satan's Sphinx which was banned by the US government because it contained hidden scanning messages that can cause the watcher harmful thoughts such as suicide. It's also said to show a lot of not safe for life stuff, so yeah, there's that. It's also said to be exactly 3 minutes and 49 seconds long. But this urban legend is basically just a creepypasta. There's no actual video of it, of course, as it's said to have been banned and censored, but come on. If this actually existed, it would be out there somewhere. Theories range from it being a CIA mind control experiment, to being an obscure snuff film, to anything in between, I guess. But it's just a legend. Most likely, anyway. Although creepily enough, as I was writing this entry, I was listening to Scare Theater's video and my speakers randomly cut out. So yeah, that happened. Also, the creepy picture that's usually associated with this video, and said to be a frame from it, it's actually thought that this creepy image is actually one of a tradition in European countries, or even an Eastern Canadian tradition called Belschle- I'm not- never mind. It's- it's this. Where you dress up in strange costumes and go to people's houses for them to guess what you are. And it's usually not like Luke Skywalker or something like that. It's usually pretty creepy stuff. But yeah, that could be one possible explanation for this image. As for the video, it's merely a myth. 
SpongeBob Brazilian defecation broadcast. What the f did I just read? Okay, now this is really obscure. We're getting deep in this iceberg. So allegedly there was a lost SpongeBob episode that was broadcast in the 2010s, shortly before the Olympics in Brazil. This episode was said to feature Squidward playing his clarinet, hitting a so-called brown note, which would cause people to lose control of their bowels. Yes, you heard that right. And it's said that over 200 children were affected heavily by this. But not only that, apparently they, and I have no idea who came up with this, poop out half of their body weight. And the theory goes that this was all somehow covered up. Now I don't think I have to explain why this is fake, but it must have taken quite an imagination to spawn this story, I'll say that much. And obviously they were probably inspired by the real life tragic event that took place during the Porygon episode of Pokemon, which we talked about earlier. Somehow this might not actually be the dumbest thing on this iceberg, believe it or not. Remember, we're only on level 6 out of 8. Super Mario FX. So this is another rumored version of Super Mario 64, much like the earlier build we talked about on level 5. This version though was supposedly called Super Mario FX, as there was no Nintendo 64 at the time. And in fact, the game was developed for the SNES, and would have been in development around 1993. The only proposed evidence that exists is that Miyamoto said one time in a Nintendo Power interview that he thought about making a 3D NES game during the development of Star Fox. Which led many people to assume that that game would use the Super FX chip used in the creation of those 3D games, hence the name Super Mario FX. But that's it, there's no actual proof that this game was worked on at all. But actually someone who worked on the development of the Super FX chip said that Super Mario FX was merely the code name for the chip itself. New Kids on the Block, NES. This was an NES game that was supposedly developed by Parker Brothers, and would have been about the American boy band, New Kids on the Block. And the game itself was thought to have been developed at some point from 1988 to 1993. There was very little information about this game out there, and actually the only evidence of it existing was a prototype box which was sold on eBay in 2009. However, a video game programmer called David Crane has gone on to say that the game was merely a concept, and no work had been done on it past the initial designs and pitches. The Grifter. Ah yes, another creepypasta. So this one I remember from the good old days of listening to Mr. Creepypasta and some ordinary gamers. Also side note Mudahar, I'm gonna need that Wario Land 3 shit pasta back. Talk about lost media, I need a re-upload of that. Hashtag Wario standing in my driveway. <clears throat> Alright, back on track. So The Grifter was an alleged video that was mentioned on where? 4chan of course, where it was said that this haunted video was the most horrible and disturbing video on the internet, and if watched, you would be killed by an unknown entity, with the only clue being a doll that would be hidden in your own home. And there were also some supposed screenshots from the video, but that was about it. Maybe not the creepiest story out there, but hey, this is one of the earlier creepypastas. X, the man with x-ray eyes, alternative ending. In 1963, there was a horror film titled X, The Man with X-Ray Eyes that was made about a doctor named James Xavier, whose experience would give him escalating vision powers, until he was eventually driven completely insane by them. And at the end of the film in the original cut, the doctor stumbles upon a revival tent, where he is told to pluck out his offending eye, which Xavier does by blinding himself, and it even shows his face with his eyes missing for a very brief moment before quickly and abruptly cutting to the credits. It's a very strange and disturbing scene, but it is also theorized by some that there was an alternate ending, one that continued after this shot, possibly holding the doctor in frame with his eyes missing. Most of the credence for this ending existing comes from the director of the film himself, who claimed that he did at one point toy around with continuing the ending past this sequence where Xavier would go on to shout in agony, I can still see, the removal of his eyes not doing anything for his plight, before fading to the credits. This would have been an even darker and more disturbing ending. However, Roger Corman, the director, only claimed to have toyed with the concept, and it's unknown whether this alternate ending was filmed or not, although it most likely wasn't, as there is no footage or even mention of it from any other cast members. 
Mario Knights. This is another one that I've talked about before, but it's a very obscure one for sure. It's an alleged Mario game for the SNES that was said to be one of the rarest in the entire Mario franchise. I have no idea though where this rumor even started, but it must have originated from this fake cover art that was made. Other than that, nothing else was known about it. However, thanks to a user on the Lost Media Wiki called The Sponge 231 we now know that the game never existed, as he sent a letter to Nintendo inquiring about it. To which they replied that they have no documentation of any game like that, released for the SNES. Still though, it is thought that while the game may have not been officially made by Nintendo, it could have been a bootleg or even a ROM hack. Although these have never been found, and the game is probably just a hoax. Medieval found footage. Now while this might sound ridiculous and absurd at first glance, which I mean it is, there's honestly something just haunting about the very concept of medieval found footage and I can't quite put my finger on it, but I'm not alone in that. There's a bunch of comments saying the same thing on one of these alleged videos, and I can't help but agree. There's just something about that notion of there being footage from a time where cameras could not have possibly existed. A time so long ago, it almost doesn't seem real. There's something unsettling about that. Maybe it's the uncanny valley or something like that? I'm not sure, but the idea is just creepy. Obviously it's not real, but I think it's a pretty cool creepypasta-like concept. Kyo Breed. This one is really obscure. And what this is referring to is an alleged game that was created by a company called Pepworks with the 3D Groove engine that was active from 1998 until 2009. Most of the games made using this engine ended up being completely lost as they were only available on 3D Groove's website, which was taken down in 2009. A lot of the games developed by Pepworks were eventually found and recovered, with one being partially found and only two being completely lost, those being Architecture Demo and Kyo Breed. Architecture Demo did though exist at one point, but apparently Kyo Breed never did. Although it did receive a trailer, which was viewed on an archived version of the website, that slated the game for a release in 2008. The game was never actually made though, as one of the game's artists, Mark Nail, said on DeviantArt, quote, Yeah, I was part of the Kyo Breed dev team, but the project was prematurely cancelled, or in development hell. I was providing story and concept art for this project. We even made our graphic design diploma with the teaser trailer. And so the game was never actually made. Goku and Frieza go to KFC, the movie. Wait, what? Goku and Frieza go to KFC, the movie. Uh... Okay, so it was said that there was a direct-to-DVD movie created and released in 2004 titled Goku and Frieza go to KFC, the movie that somehow ended up being lost. How you could not save something as weird as this if it was ever released is beyond me. The plot of the film is mostly unknown. However, it was stated that after Goku defeated Frieza, he went to KFC to celebrate, but Frieza hated KFC as he was quote, a Taco Beller. What the f is this? It was also further stated that at some point Goku quote, cheats on KFC with Popeyes and that the original VHS tape and that the original VHS tape was stolen in 1999 and had to be completely remade for a DVD release in 2004. The only proof of this being an alleged screenshot from the film. Okay, so obviously this is a joke, but uh, you can blame LSSQ for this one apparently. I guess he made a joke about Frieza spitting in Goku's KFC like a couple of years ago. So yeah, I guess that's the origin of this. How this didn't make it to the bottom of this iceberg, I have no clue. This has to be the dumbest thing I've ever read in relation to Lost Media. Although to be fair, I would love to see a Dragon Ball KFC movie. Useless.avi Okay, so this is like a creepypasta within a creepypasta. Let me explain. So this alleged video, Useless.avi, is a video from another creepypasta called Normal for Normal People, in which the protagonist goes on a strange website that features a variety of disturbing videos one of which is called useless.ebi, which featured a hairless red painted chimpanzee and a woman tied up, who the chimpanzee would brutally murder and eat on camera. Uh, yeah, this video is not real, because it's from a creepypasta. A creepy video within a creepy fake story. But can I just say that my favorite part of this whole thing 
is that the chimpanzee got on the villain's wiki. Secondary antagonist, by the way. Shout out to all my evildoers out there. Occupation. Creepy pasta. Goals. Eat the kidnapped woman. Succeeded. All right, I'll stop. Original Mathras. So this one is kind of weird. I think what this is referring to is the character of Mathras from Mugen, which if you don't know what that is, it's basically a fighting game engine that has been used to create and add many different characters from different franchises over the years. And Mathras was a rumored character spread around the Mugen forms in regards to the topic of who the cheapest character in the game was. And in that conversation, Mathras was always in the list. In fact, this legend spiraled even more out of control, to the point where Mathras was said to be a computer virus that was accessible through Mugen that could brick your PC if used. However, this was nothing but a rumor that evolved into somewhat of a creepypasta. Not only is there no footage of Mathras crashing or breaking anyone's computer, but it's simply not possible with modern technology. And people a lot more qualified than me have broken down why that is. Either way, it's an interesting tale that kind of reminds me of something like Zalgo. Two men, one girl, one supper. So this was an alleged shock video that was originally reacted to by YouTube user Veloista on August 17th, 2020. The video itself was said to feature a teenage girl being violently abused by her father while being filmed by a cameraman who laughed at the scene in question. The only proof of its existence at all are the reaction videos that have popped up ever since the first one was released in 2020. Most people believe it to be fake as it can't actually be found anywhere online, and some have furthered the rumors saying that they have seen it and that nobody should ever watch it. These reaction videos only show someone reacting to the video alongside the audio from the supposed original video, which can be heard, which just contains a strange song as well as a man yelling and a girl screaming, along with some random slapping noises. It's very strange indeed, and although multiple people have claimed to react to it through YouTube videos, there's no actual footage of it out there. Couple that with the fact that these reactions sound pretty tame considering the subject matter, and the fact that there is a creepypasta written about it, yeah, this is most likely a hoax. 9-11 news interrupting Goku's transformation in Brazil. And just when I thought we were done with the weird Dragon Ball stuff. Now this is so obscure in fact, the only information on it that I could find was on the Reddit post for this iceberg. One user named Mr. Frog 1701 elaborated on the legend saying that on a famous TV station in Brazil called Globo, there was a morning block of cartoons which also featured Dragon Ball. And according to the legend, during Goku's transformation into Super Saiyan 3, the station stopped the broadcast and sent out an emergency 9-11 broadcast, as this was September 11th, 2001. Although this is most likely a mere legend, as the episode where Goku transforms into Super Saiyan 3 didn't air in the US until 2002, and in Brazil in 2001, they were still airing the original Dragon Ball, which was many arcs and years behind Dragon Ball Z. So yeah, this story is most likely false. Three orangutans, one blender. Are you starting to see a trend here? So this was another alleged shock video that was supposedly circulated around the internet. The video itself was said to feature orangutans being brutally maimed on camera. However, like the two men, one girl, one supper video, it started as just a reaction, with the earliest known one being posted to YouTube on March 8th, 2008, by user Demonico, who supposedly reacted to the video. Many more people reacted to the video over the years, and people were divided on whether it was real or not. On one hand, it was impossible to find for obvious reasons, but on the other hand, so many people were reacting to it. And come on, this was 2008. But it was eventually found that all of these reactions used the same audio, which appeared to just be a garage band loop with monkey sounds added in. Yeah, not even orangutan sounds, more like stock monkey noises. Cop Slapper NES. Another extremely obscure one here. I guess that's fitting since we've made it to the deepest layer. So Cop Slapper is an alleged unlicensed NES game created by Color Dreams, and it was first mentioned as far as I know on the NES World website, where there was a list of unreleased and rumored NES games, with the developer and publisher listed as Color Dreams. There was also a mention of it in 2009 on a forum called Digit Press by an aptly named user, Mr. Obscure. 
where he stated that he acquired two prototype Flintstones games and a game called Cop Slapper, attaching three images to the post, which are now deleted. But that's all I could find on this, and it's probably nothing more than an urban legend or just a cancelled project, as no ROMs or gameplay have ever surfaced from it. Six girls, one dead guy. Another supposed lost shock video like the many others on this tier. Six girls, one dead guy allegedly has four different versions, with all being very similar, involving six girls who would mutilate one man's corpse on camera. This video, like all the others, were first discovered through reactions to it, with many coming out after the first one's release. And obviously there is no footage from the actual video. The only proof is these reactions. The general consensus is that it's just an obvious hoax. Much like three orangutans, one blender. Past the existence. Okay, I definitely am not saying that right, but it can be translated in English as simply no existence. So it's basically just an alleged lost film that's very obscure. In fact, the only thing that I could find on it was in another Iceberg Explained video on YouTube looking at lost films. In it, this film is in the final tier of non-existence. It was supposedly known as a French film from the late 70s or 80s, which was said to be nothing but a black screen, although some said that they thought it was possibly a white screen, with the movie only ending by the film burning inside the projector at its only screening. It's definitely a creepy yet interesting story, though there is no evidence to prove that this is real, and it's so obscure almost no one has even talked about it. Although it is a very interesting story to say the least. And that wraps it up for the fake lost media iceberg. There's definitely some ones I recognized in here, but there's definitely some ones I found really interesting and some I did not even know about. So I hope you guys enjoyed the video. Uh, please leave a like if you did. This one took a lot of effort and a lot of, uh, a lot of research, so if you could leave a like, that would be uh, greatly appreciated. Also, let me know if you enjoyed this iceberg type of video. I'm definitely open to making more videos like this or just longer videos in general, so let me know what you guys think. Anyway, this is Sourcebrew, and I will see you guys next time.